Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. If you're joining us for the first time, an extra special welcome to you. We've had a fair number of new listeners in the last few weeks, so let's go ahead and introduce ourselves briefly. We do this every so often. And we're talking about the Christian philosophy of pet ownership today. There's a string of words I never expected to say in that order. <laughs> so tell us who you are and also a fun animal story, if you will. <laughs> Brian, would you like to go first? Sure. So I'm Brian, and uh, my, my fun pet story is that our last dog loved to chase squirrels. Uh, to the point you could say the word, and uh, we normally had the the back door open during summer because breeze and all that, and he would go right out the door, and he had basically uh, worn a path in the backyard grass <laughs> from running back and forth. And one time, uh, we were watching Up, which the the Pixar film, and in the movie, Doug shows up. The, for the first time, he goes, hello, my name is Doug, and I love you, squirrel. And our last dog <laughs> got up and ran out the back door. And we started laughing so much, we had to pause the movie and tried to repeat it. It didn't work the second time, unfortunately. He but got your number at that point. He, knew he there was did. No Max was a very squirrel. good dog. <laughs> what a good boy. Indeed. Mm. Well, I'm Greg. I'm older than everybody else here by a little bit. But when I was about five, I had two little turtles, really little turtles, not tortoises, turtles. Like the and, little box turtles that live in the yeah, goldfish bowl? Yeah, and they were in not so much a bowl as in some kind of little plastic things with molded stairs that could be in the water, mm -hmm. out of the water. It was, And I must have had them, I don't know, weeks, months. And then one morning I got up and they were gone. And I asked my parents what happened to the turtles. And my parents wisely said, they must have escaped during the night. <laughs> and I never saw them again, ever. <laughs> I was a naive child. I love that. <laughs> Escape the turtles. This is like the start of a children's book. <laughs> it is. I want to know about their adventures and the friends they made along the way. As they hitchhiked from California to New York. Uh, somehow I don't think they made it that far. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. Well, I'm Emily, and my story is pretty recent. It's when I was house-sitting for my parents in rural Virginia recently. They had some older chickens and some younger chickens. And the younger chickens had to be put into their cage at night. Otherwise, they were free-range. They'd just wander around the yard and eat bugs and stuff. But at night, you go out and you close the door on them. And first night we're there, they're all in the cage. Great. We count them. They're all there. We close up the cage. Great. Go to bed. Next day, there's like one chicken in the cage and the rest are on top of the cage. And so we're like, okay. <laughs> and we take them off the top of the cage, put them inside the cage and close the cage and go to bed. Next day, there is one chicken in the cage, and the rest are nowhere to be found. <laughs> and we look all over. We look under all the cars, under the trailer, every, everywhere that we can think of. But we didn't look up. <laughs> ah, <laughs> because the rest up. of the chickens were in the tree above the cage. And we could not get them down. So that's where they slept for the rest of the time that we were house sitting because we couldn't get them out of the tree. That's my fun story. That's amazing. It was a good time. All right. So we're talking about pets today. Um, and in order to talk about pets, we have to talk about animals. And in order to talk about animals, we kind of have to know a little bit about what animals are. They're animals. Yep. <laughs> what does the word animal mean? Well, well, it, it comes it, from. It, oh, you were going to add. No, 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 no you, you, you get it. It comes from the Latin term anima, which means soul. Are you telling me that animals have souls? I actually am. Yes. Amazing. But but I always was told they don't, and so they don't go to heaven. There's no puppy heaven or kitty heaven. Isn't the image of God a soul? Mm, 
Apparently These are things not. that we've all been told in Sunday school. So let's let's yeah. One pull of the greatest dis- disseminators of false theology, I think, is often Sunday school. That I mean, it's not the fault of the of the people who teach it. So much of it is as the people who tell them. Yeah, I know you're a new Christian. You don't know anything about the Bible. We don't have anybody else in your building. Go teach the kids. That's how my mom got to be a Sunday school teacher. Oh my. And I think it's been repeated many, many times. There doesn't seem to be any requirement for knowing anything to teach Sunday school. Not to say there aren't wonderful Sunday school teachers. It doesn't seem to require much to write Sunday school curriculum. For that matter, he says, being very bitter about um, some things he's seen lately. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're working on that. In Genesis 1, God says on the fourth day, fifth day, sorry, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth in the evening and the morning with the fifth day. Um, there's a number of things we should take note of before we move on to talking about pets. Um, first of all, hath life, hath nefesh, the Hebrew word for soul, as Brian has already pointed out, carries over in Latin too. So from the beginning, despite everything we may have been told by Sunday school teachers or parents, with the best of intentions, the Bible most certainly says that animals have or perhaps better, are living souls. That they have the they're injured with the breath of life. As we go through the other chapters of Genesis, as far as the flood, when everything that has breath has the breath of life in it dies, and the, the scriptures are including animals. There's an interesting shift there. I noticed the mm-hmm. last time I read through the flood account is that before the flood, you talk about living things as having the breath of life. And after the flood, it's the blood. Mm, yeah. Mm. That that you are so right, and I have never recognized that or processed that, but yes. Yeah. You know, the the and the word the word so often later on is the nefesh is in the blood. The soul is mm. in the blood. Even as late as Revelation, when we see the souls of them that have been slain for the word of God are under the altar crying out for vengeance, it's still the souls, it's the psyche, the Hmm. It's the it's it's I mean the image is the blood, but we're told it's the souls of of the martyrs. So there's that interplay goes on, and hmm. I I don't I've never studied it. I don't know much about it. I just I just point out it's there, and maybe somebody can come up with something for us there. But back to animals, the other thing um, that I would point out is the in chapter twenty or verse twenty one, God created, and the word created only appears three times in Genesis one. It appears, and the Hebrew word behind it, bara. It appears when God made heaven and earth, that is when the first, for the first time he made time, space, and matter. And it appears here when God creates life, sentience, self-movingness. And then it appears one more time when God creates man in his own image. So these are three mm. different levels or different types of creation, creation of what in modern scientific terms would be bare matter, energy particles. But then animal life is something else. It's not there, There's no in-between plant life thing. Plants do not have the fish. They do not have the breath of life. They are complex chemical arrangements that mimic sentient life. And sometimes God will use, use them as metaphors for life. But they're, they're not alive in the biblical sense. And then we come to man, who is the very image of God. And in that sense, is qualitatively different from animals. And I assume that's well, I, I guess we have to focus on both of those. Animals are more than plant life. They're more than complex chemicals. But man is the image of God is more than simply an animal, too. And so when we start measuring out the value of our pets, uh, God obviously values them more than he does plants or rocks. But man is in a different category. So those are some things we need to take into account. And God, before he ever speaks to man, speaks to the animals, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. Now, at this point, we've only got um, birds and fish, fish and fowl, uh, and, and anything else that flies like bats. Um, 
And I don't know if this would include birds that don't fly. Probably not, because God draws <laughs> what the What about lines. the penguins? Yeah, penguins. Where do the penguins go? <laughs> Tell me. Uh, God draws the lines a little differently than we do. He, he draws it in terms of, of spheres of activity rather than um, DNA, as we would think. Uh, but he, he talks to these creatures out loud in a voice. That's significant, because we tend to talk to our animals. And when we do, we're imaging God. But the other thing here is that he tells them to to be fruitful and multiply, the same thing he will say to, to man. Uh, it is God has put within, and it's a blessing that they should do so. Now, we have a problem with that. We generally, in the late, late 20th century, okay, I'm, I'm 20 years out of date. The beginning of the 21st century, we generally are opposed to animals breeding and being fruitful and and spreading around, and and you could Bob probably Parker. make some yeah you can probably make some good arguments under certain cases, but that in in general God thinks that that animal life is a good thing and, and that there should be much of it, and to take a, a zero population growth view toward animals is is not compatible with what God actually told them to do, and, and that telling is itself a blessing. God blessed them when he said this. And that brings us to chapter 20, or verse 25, we keep going to say chapter. God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so, and God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And he goes on and does that a couple of verses later. So here we have the rest of God's creatures. And, and here again, God categorizes on his own terms, we have cattle, which would be domesticated creatures probably not living in your house, like cows and sheep and goats and things like that. Creeping things, the things we go, ew, yuck, now, but once we didn't. And the beasts, which are not domesticated, but at this point were not hostile to man. They would, they could come up and give you a lick and without you being afraid they were sampling you for supper. <laughs> uh, because all of this was placed under man's dominion, man's stewardship. We don't like the word dominion. Mm -hmm. But what it means in a Christian context is stewardship. God has placed these, these creatures under your charge so that you can, one, care for them and protect them and nurture them, and two, make them better than they were. Whether that involves some degree of selective reading, whether it involves training and teaching them tricks, whether it means using them to carry or to ride upon. Personally, I would like to ride on a pterodactyl, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, these, these are things that, that God put into our charge. And, and, and in our day, when so many people in the green movement don't, they, they don't want us to use animals, they don't want us to eat animals, they don't want us to take clothing off of animals. I, I, I'm surprised they even let us have them as pets anymore, because isn't that condescending? Shouldn't the animals be free? <laughs> Maybe I've missed something. Uh, but uh, this, this is there's, how God arranged it. There's probably some crazy person on, on the fringe there. Yeah, it just seems like it shouldn't be fringe, is, is all I'm thinking about. I think I think I probably have run into that. I just can't It's the logical it. conclusion. You know. Yeah. Follow the line. Well, you know, I, I, there have, I know there have been movies and such where the... The Tarzan like character breaks in and, and releases all the horses so they can be free and things like that. Oh my. I don't know if anyone's taking taken it in, a, in the larger sense of letting all, all of our pets go free, releasing all the birds from their cages and throwing the fish into the toilet so they can swim. I mm, we have some wacky um people in the green movement and, and sometimes some very vicious and deadly ones too. Yeah. So this this is what God set before man, and there's perfect harmony there, but there's not equality. The animals were not human. They were not the image of God, but they were living, sentient beings who have, after fashion, emotions and thought processes and volition, uh, and, and we begin to, we can begin to think about that. And this, this is where a zoology comes in. I, I remember when I was much younger, we were told, well, one thing that sets man apart from the animals is that 
man uses tools. No animal ever uses a tool. Uh, yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we found Even that there Raven, are... Ravens yeah. use yeah. tools to a certain extent. It's like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there, there's, there's quite a few that learn how to use this to get that uh, and learn to do so repeatedly if need be. Uh, certainly they do build structures and houses for themselves. True, the same way their ancestors 6,000 years ago did. And they don't seem to innovate. Uh, Chesterton in The Everlasting Man makes the point that uh, what, whatever you can say about man, he's always the artist because whatever the horse or the hound does, they do it the same way forever. They don't pass through their blue period into their cubist <laughs> period, into their surrealistic <laughs> period. Not even as they evolve. Yeah. <laughs> Not even as they evolve do they do this. You know, it's, it's, it's always the same. Yeah. And then, and then the issue of do they understand speech? Well, what does that mean? I mean, mm -hmm. I have a book that I, I have not read in, in total by any means, but it's called Dr. Doolittle's Delusion. <laughs> you remember Dr. Doolittle? From yeah. Books? Yeah. yeah. I remember the movie. Oh, please. <laughs> the older Sorry, one the... or the more recent one? The older one. Okay. Rex Harrison speaks singing. Yeah. Talk to the animals. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the point of the book, I believe, is that animals don't actually speak, but that they do something else that we mistake for. And I, I haven't read it. I have a, another book that I, I, well, don't exactly assign, but a number of my students have chosen to read. It's King Solomon's Ring which also talks about how animals communicate with one another, even when such things as the, the length to which they chop down the grass they're grazing on, it does send signals mm. to other animals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you, you, you wanted animal stories. I assume you could probably come up with some of your own here. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's an old post I saw once about, you know, sci scientists have discovered that elephants make a certain noise when bees are nearby to warn the herd to move away and mm. someone's like responds it goes like oh that's so lame i wish humans had a noise to do that and it's like we do <laughs> we screaming. say there are bees in this area move away <laughs> we have we have these words that we can do this for <laughs> Who picked up on the word "go" as in "go for a walk," mm -hmm. and um, we had we had we learned we had to be very careful. If we want to say "scamp," you want to go, you want to go. <laughs> but then there were times when I remember my mom just saying, "Hey, honey, we go up and and see Harvey," and the word "go" was in the sentence there, which is part of the flow. And immediately, my dog said, <laughs> Really? Really? You pick up the one word out of all that. Well, that's okay. That's great. Um, our, our older cats uh, will respond to the words night, night, at least when I utter them, not apparently when everybody else does all the time. And uh, my oldest daughter, Emily, has, as you saw before we started, has a little kitten and she and her youngest sister are working on trying to teach the cat some words. Not sure how that's going up. So it, it is true that animals can understand sounds and can connect them with particular processes, events, places. And of course, there's the, was it an orangutan that could do signing mm. yeah. to some considerable? Gorilla? I think oh, it was gorilla, a Coco. Was it a, yeah. So we, we acknowledge that freely as Christians. We're not surprised at it. This is an area for scientific investigation. They look like us in some ways, you know, the two eyes and the nose and the mouth. And it's it's easy to believe, especially with the with the uh, primates, that um, that there's a lot going on up there, especially the dolphins. Especially the dolphins. <laughs> yeah. They've been trying to warn us for years through yeah. the dances, and we <laughs> never <laughs> heeded them. Yeah, it's just going to be all. so long. Thanks well, for all the fish. As long as they appreciate the fish, I guess it's all. That <laughs> uh, it, the sad thing is how many people didn't get that. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah. So we we move in to in, into the garden and into we actually we do the flashback story in Genesis two where Adam is told to name the animals and he, that means understanding them, processing their place in creation, in relationship to himself, one another in the garden, and giving them names that would reflect that. And so Adam is the first zoologist, and in the process he comes to learn about himself. And this is something that. We, we can track through the Bible, and particularly the book of Proverbs, God says, go look at the animals and get some wisdom. Go to the ant. Go to somewhere. the ant, you sluggard. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
there are four creatures that upon the earth that are exceeding well, they're small but exceeding wise and we've got the coney and the ant and the locust and something i don't remember mm -hmm. spider i heard so many sermons about those in chapel as a kid um, and, and, and so there, there's a lot going on here. They're not just a thing that God threw out there that we happen to stumble across and say, oh, isn't it great that these things are good to eat? Um, God had more intention for us and them than that. They are things to learn from. They are things to take care of. They are things to train and develop. They they are their comrades and 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 uh, friends. What was Lewis's line? Jesters, playfellows, and servants i think in in one mm. of his one of the space trilogy books i think uh and 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 it is in this context that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god had made mm. and in that story we have things history it really happened we have a beast assuming a role a beast should not be assuming and, and of course the question that every every kid who's hearing the story for the first time at least taking it seriously for the first time is going to raise his hand and say wait 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 why is she talking to a snake did snakes talk <laughs> to which i have to say i don't think so but i really don't well this one did obviously <laughs> right <laughs> um well why why was she why didn't she go on talking to the beast wouldn't you <laughs> She's it would be rude to just yeah. walk away. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's an unfallen, harmless, wonderful world full of all kinds of things. She, she, I mean, everything was an adventure, excitement, miraculous after a fashion. So here's one more thing. It's an animal that talks. Wow, that's that, that seems pretty good. The problem was not in talking to the serpent. The problem is when the serpent took the line of conversation or a particular line and she, she and her husband didn't do something about this. But before we're done... Uh, well, the beast approaches the woman, the woman, her husband, and the husband passes judgment on God. When God comes, he reverses the order, talks first to the man, then the woman, and then finally curses the serpent who who bears the burden in part of this sin. And we see the whole creation put under, under the curse to share it with man because the whole creation is covenanted with man, first in Adam and then later in Christ. And so again, the animals are not just stage scenery that happen to wander in and out occasionally. They they have a crucial role in this drama of redemption. We took them down with us. What have we done to our fair sister? I think it was the Beatles saying. <laughs> well, we, we hurt creation really badly. It's amazing that, that the animals are so forgiving. They don't say, <laughs> there they are! Get them! <laughs> well, a lot of them do, especially in Australia. <laughs> oh, Australia, yes, Australia is where all of that negativity towards humans <laughs> yeah. was cordoned off for our own good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I see a sci-fi fantasy story in that so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Why don't we go there? Um, but then at the end of that chapter, after God makes the promise of redemption, we see animals yet again when God takes two animals. We're just told God made coats of skins. We're not told whether these were cattle or beasts, presumably cattle, because well, sheep, goats, because that are bulls, because that's what God's going to use for the rest of Scripture. And in the next chapter, that's what Abel's going to use, the first things of the flock and the path thereof. So in, in, in this, we see God killing animals, and he doesn't just tell us to do it. He himself is the first person to kill an animal. Um, and he, he kills the animal for two reasons. One, the religious sacrifice. And two, clothing. And presumably from there on, Adam and Eve and their descendants understand that those two reasons are valid reasons uh, for killing animals. You can also think there's, there's probably an implied third one having to do with the serpent and he's going to get his head crushed. <laughs> so when the, when the animals start getting vicious or sneaky, and trying to undermine your culture and civilization and bring about to uh, immunitize the eschaton, um, <laughs> you 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 are you are allowed to smash them. Yeah, clear and present them. danger. Yes, you can you can kill them to, for self protection. Those there's still one more that that comes later with Noah, but those those are basic things. Mm -hmm. And so it's from a biblical point of view, thou shalt not kill does not mean you can't kill animal life. Having said that, Proverbs tells us that the the righteous man regards the life of his beast. Mm -hmm. And the word for life there, again, is the word for soul. Whatever that 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 spiritual, non-material thing that's going into the animal that makes it different from everything else, a godly, righteous man will regard that, will take it seriously, will treat the animal with kindness. That doesn't 
mean that we're not going to kindly kill them and eat them, but we're not going to be brutal to them along the way. And there are implications there that this is a good place where farmers mm -hmm. can work this out. And there was a time when I think generally they did. Um, but that, that in itself opens up such a can of worms where I'm not an expert. Yeah. So now we have, oh, well, let's throw in the, the, the last one, which I just did. Eating. You can eat them. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the original diet, the only restriction was no blood, no vampirism. Israel was put on a pig-free diet for a while. Uh, and the dietary laws were very specific as to what they could and could not eat. But with the coming of the gospel, these animals represent men. as the lamb on the altar represented men. Mm -hmm. So we are free to open it up and incorporate all kinds of animal slash men into the kingdom of God by devouring them into God's, into God's uh, church, into God's kingdom. So there's our, there's our theological background, at least for part of it. Now, Emily, I think there was something you wanted, a place you wanted to go or something you want to talk about. Uh, yeah. I think I, I generally see two different extremes when it comes to pets specifically. Mm -hmm. These days I see fur babies on the one hand where people my age, young professionals, don't want children because kids are expensive and demand a lot of attention and care. But there's still this nurturing impulse so they adopt a dog or a cat, and that becomes their sort of low-commitment family that they mm -hmm. love on and spend lots of money on. And then I see, on the other hand, as a reaction to that, this idea that, no, dogs are for kids so that kids can <laughs> learn responsibility, and that's all they're good for. Otherwise, no animals in the house. Um, and I think both of those... I mean, I hate to set up, you know, the false dichotomy and say, well, the truth is somewhere in the middle, but I think <laughs> the truth is not in either of these options. For a <laughs> Agreed. But, yeah. Because no, uh, espe especially ahead. in like, um, I would say, Reformed Christian circles, you you do have two extremes. And, and one of them is to say animals literally don't matter because they're not humans. Yeah. And therefore, there's you don't have to care about them. You can kill dogs if you wanted to, because it doesn't matter. They're just they're just an animal, and uh, it's really just cultural differences that lead to us enshrining dogs as something you don't kill. And then the other being what Emily has already mentioned about you know these are these are a, the member a member of my family, and I shall love them as though they were a child of mine. <laughs> And both sides tend to take like these really straw man arguments of the other side <laughs> where it's like the the side that don't that think animals uh, aren't important at all basically say, oh, you don't want children and you hate fertility and da 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 da. And you just want to do all this stuff to the dogs instead of the children. And you're horrible and God hates you. Uh, <laughs> don't you know that heaven's going to be great enough without animals? Like that's one argument I've legitimately heard. Wow. And then the other side is like, but my dog Susie from age three, <laughs> he, she has to be in heaven to meet me. Um, and you're a horrible mean person who is basically not the, the Hitler of dogs. Um, <laughs> so it's like there, there is a answer to this issue that is none of these extreme <laughs> options. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I want to say that that's just because the people who hold these extreme views are louder than the people who don't. <laughs> so I want to say that they're a loud minority. I really hope that. <laughs> I, I hope so. I haven't heard that much of either, but then I don't hang around in either of those circles a whole lot. I suppose growing up as a kid, uh, in Northern California, everybody was a hunter, mm. but there was an understanding that you killed the animal and you you took its meat, you got it cut up, and put it, you salted it, or you put it in, in the, I can't think of the word, but freezer is what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, you didn't waste, you didn't just go out and mm -hmm. shoot everything you could and leave it there and go off laughing. Uh, there was in that sense, at least a respect for it. And there was gen a general observation of of the rules of we'll call it civilized hunting. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, we see that with 
the pattern of serial killers, right? Mm -hmm. When when a young person goes off and without any sense of sport or gain is killing animals, that shows us that there's something wrong there's in that person's wrong, mind. Yeah. yeah. And some some of my students were av were avid hunters. And uh, as I was teaching through Esau, who of course is a hunter, <laughs> they got very defensive. <laughs> well, maybe he was just trying to cull the herd because it was in danger of overpopulation. He was he was exercising reasonable animal husbandry. <laughs> okay, notice that it says he's a cunning hunter. Why would he have to be cunning? Because there weren't that many animals. You know, never <laughs> and then the question came came up. Well, will there be hunting in heaven or in the new heavens and new earth? Interesting of course question. there will be. You can hunt them all you want. You just can't kill anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then they turn around and say, my turn, take it. And then, you know, they go after you. Um, <laughs> this sounds so much fun, actually. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm stoked. <laughs> I feel like there was a comic about that where, like, the mouse gets cornered by the big cat and it's like, aha, I have you now. Boop, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw something like that in an old uh, sci fi TV show where it was like a, a one minute vignette of the guy running from the monster all over and diving and <laughs> hiding and swerving. And finally, the monster has him face to face and he does exactly that. Like, you're it. And runs off giggling, maniacally. <laughs> um, Actually, come to think of it, this may have been Calvin and Hobbes that I was thinking about. <laughs> there you go. And there you go. Calvin and Hobbes. So we have, <laughs> even in our uh, entertainments, we like to reuse upon animals that are semi-sentient or semi-intelligent, I guess, because they are sentient. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple other passages I think we should consider. And the one that... Uh, that, that answers absolutely no questions for us. And, and I think it's good that it doesn't. Uh, the wise man in Ecclesiastes, considering the fact that all men die, and that in that respect, men are like beasts. He says, "I, this is chapter 3, verse 18. I said in my heart concerning the estates of the sons of men, that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts, in the sense that they die. Uh, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath. So that a man hath no preeminence above a beast that is under heaven as far as we can see, for all is vanity. All go into one place, the grave, the earth, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. And just leaving it there, it would be easy to accuse him of blatant materialism or humanism, saying that, see, he's not, this is this is not a prophet, this is this is just some of inspired account of humanism. But he does not end there. He says this, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? So he's saying that it's with regard to what we can see. Yeah, humans die, animals die. We put them, we both put them both in the ground. Their corpses uh, dissolve, return to dust. We can't see anything more than that. And on that basis, we can conclude that man's no better than animal. But he says, but the soul, the spirit, who, it, it, yes, it's there, no kidding, but you can't see it. You can't see the spirit of man that goes up to God, returns to God who gave it, nor can you see the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth. Now, we already have enough from what we've seen to not be surprised that the wise man would speak of animals of having spirits. And we can see that the spirit of man, the spirit of beast have different destinies. The question is, what in the world does he mean when he says the spirit goes into the earth? We can't assume and say, oh, that just means it dissolves into basic chemical elements. It's not a chemical element. It's not a chemical mm -hmm. compound. So I don't know what that means. But yeah. I, think it, I, I think it's a nice slap in the face to our arrogance that says, well, animals are nothing. So obviously they just, <laughs> they go away. Rather than saying, you know what? The Bible is not terribly clear. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. They are not humans. They're not the image of God. They don't go to our heaven upon their death, but they go someplace. Do they maintain consciousness? Can they be recalled to consciousness? That's all we got. They go. The spirit goes down into the earth. Whatever that means, God knows. Uh, maybe and different, different translations frame it differently. 
Um, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I don't know the merits of mm -hmm. King James versus ESV on this point. Mm -hmm. But I think the ESV says, who knows whether the spirit of man goes up and the spirit of the beast goes down. And mm -hmm. that's like a whole yeah. extra level of uncertainty about this yes. whole question. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that leaves, that leaves some things open. And I'm not a Hebrew scholar either, but it's not, I don't, I'm not surprised that the wise man might might have been a little vague here because it's kind of the point. There's so much we don't know. And when our our little, you know, three-year-old girl comes to us and says, my, my cat died, will I ever see him again? No, he's dead. There's no cat. I haven't <laughs> given up. Don't even think about it. I, it's bad enough that some people do it, but that they do it in the name of God. No, the Bible says that you're, no, the Bible says no such thing. It is incredibly is vague, vague on the yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but then again, there's a lot of people who speak very firmly on things the Bible's vague. <laughs> no, you know, they become the voice of the Bible. Um, That's one thing I appreciate about C.S. Lewis. He has a section about animal pain in the problem of pain. Mm. And almost the first thing he says is, this is all speculation. <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging that. That's a very good starting point. Bless. He was he was an enemy of uh, vivisection, of uh, cutting up animals just to see what might be there. Really? That's and he makes that a, a, a minor theme in that hideous strength. Ah, mm -hmm. that explains the, those sections. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And why the animals get to revolt in the end. <laughs> <laughs> You can just imagine um, Lewis kind of snickering to himself as he's writing that. Like, <laughs> he suggests, if I remember correctly, that the heaven for mosquitoes could be in the same place as the hell for people. That would be very convenient. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Dante actually may have done something like that. That makes a lot of sense. There is one other animal, a uh, particular animal, that I think we should at least uh, give a nod to. Uh, Balaam has been hired to go curse <laughs> God's people. And uh, God first says no, and then says, all right, when they call you, you may go for my purposes. And they, he doesn't wait. He just jumps on the donkey and starts going for his own purposes. God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now, what's really important, uh, I, I think, for the harsher version of Krishna is, is to remember, well, yeah, both for both sides, I think that the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant, is Jesus. So we we we're seeing Jesus interacting with both the prophet and the animal, the donkey, the ass, if you will. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how many older Sunday school teachers will not use that word with their children. Uh, and. Um, the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned out aside out of the way and then went into the field. Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, the wall being on this side and the wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, he fell, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with his staff. So the first thing, now you can say, well, this is a miracle. This was a special occasion. This never happens. It doesn't say that. It just says the donkey had more spiritual insight than the prophet, which I don't <laughs> find surprising at all. <laughs> Oh my! Uh, she could, she could see the angel. Well, think and about knew, all the times we're told creation is praising the Lord. Yeah, exactly. Or groaning together in pain, waiting for our redemption. Anyway, or how she, often a cat just stares blankly into an empty space in the house. That's what I was going to actually. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't mean to take that from you. I apologize. Yeah, no, that's that's great because that I thought that maybe was just me and actually David Farsher. I think was the first one. Yeah, when cats suddenly startle up and go over someplace and then they're looking at something. Yeah, it's angels. <laughs> that would explain a lot if they can see hey, into a dimension we can't. <laughs> um, and and she responds intelligently. She this is her master. He's not a great master, but she understands the relationship here and. 
She understands that this angel person's about to kill. She knows what the sword is <laughs> and how he's going to use it. And she decides that she has the liberty to try to save him. She does not feel compelled by the mere presence of Christ not to save her master. And and so she in the end, she just drops down and, and Balaam's smacking her donkey. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said to Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? You know, it is a great marvel that the ass spoke, but what I think is a greater marvel is that Balaam answered her. <laughs> Balaam said to the ass, because well, again, hast... it would be rude to answer. <laughs> it's because just an thou... immediate human response. It's like someone's yeah. talking to me. Well, because... <laughs> <laughs> because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto this day, or do so unto thee? And, and God, who knows the beginning from the ending, and ordained that Anglo-Saxon should arise out of Latin influences, records that the prophet said, Nay. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. See, he couldn't see what the, what the donkey could already see. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing away, his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed up, down upon his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? <laughs> Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before thee. And they asked, the, the ass saw me and, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. <laughs> you got a cool donkey there. I would have I would have left her live, but I was about ready to kill you. <laughs> um, interesting perspective. There was there was this thing back, you know, when, what would Jesus do, which degenerated into how would Jesus vote? What would Jesus drive? And what would Jesus shoot? And, <laughs> and there, well, it wasn't so much the target as it was what kind of handgun would he use? Uh, well, he prefers slamming swords, it seems. <laughs> but he, I mean, this, this, is, this is Jesus. He's got a sword. It's drawn. And he says in no uncertain terms, I was ready to slice and dice you. But you got a cool donkey. I was going to leave her alone. Uh, the only other times we see Jesus interacting with animals that I can remember, we're told in Mark's gospel after the temptation, when the angels came and ministered to him, that he was in the desert with the wild animals, mm. whatever that means. And then the uh, the last would be in the book of Revelation, when he is portrayed, I, I would take it to be symbolically, riding a white horse. It's not sinful to ride horses. You have not subdued them to your human ways and needs and, and thus broken their spirit. I mean, Jesus rides a horse. Actually, there's there's another one in Zechariah's prophecy where the angel of the Lord also was riding a horse. So I'm Jesus sorry, did you already well. mention him riding into Jerusalem? Oh, the oh, donkey! Yeah. Oh, 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 of course, a donkey. Just like <laughs> this one. Yeah. This donkey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this donkey, this donkey right here, yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, it's 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 a side angle. Jesus does. Paul says, "Does God take thought for oxen?" It says, "No." He, he's writing the commandment for us, and yet, and yet, I, Jonah, Jonah, like God <laughs> is concerned with the city full of people and all of their cattle, and all of their cattle, also much cattle. Uh, the birds of the field, he feeds them. Uh, and all of Psalm 1 4 is a beautiful hymn to how God orchestrates what we call nature, his, his creation, all of its all of its parts, and how he feeds the animals and he waters them and such. Mm -hmm. So these are well, we beautiful can also parts. think of uh, you know, not a sparrow falls out of the sky no. except mm -hmm. your father sees him, how much more you. Yeah. And and there's and I'm glad you included that that second part because yes, God does care for the animals, but how much more important are you and in um if you can think of anything else throw it in because i'm going to <laughs> isaiah 11 well there's the leviathan well there's the leviathan form to play with yeah <laughs> uh, fetch and yeah and re <laughs> and remember that originally god made the great whales and the word there is sea monsters 
So God made these things. And they the fact that they became evil and dangerous, evil in the sense that they, they do damage, not that they're sinful. Although my, my girls keep going back and forth. Are you sure cats can't sin? <laughs> um, we wonder about that one sometimes. The answer is um, yes, they can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're... The, the fall changed them, but they were always the chief of the ways of God. They were always these great, incredible things that we should stand in awe of. And Job uh, sees Leviathan behemoth on those terms. In uh, chapter 11 of Isaiah, the end of, um, or the climax of uh, Isaiah's Christmas sermon that includes the virgin birth and unto us a child is born, he, he comes to this. Uh, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, the young lion, and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the seas." And depending upon your eschatological bent, you can do a number of things with this. You can put it in a future Jewish millennium. You can purely spiritualize it. You can look for both a spiritual and a more literal fulfillment as the gospel works itself out. I mean, we, we started taking care of animals because of the influence of Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's that's the simple truth. Yeah. Um, the, get rid of all the Hinduism and, and Native American animistic nonsense. Uh, we started inviting animals into our homes and caring for them and creating veterinary hospitals for animals under the influence of Christianity, sometimes tinged with other beliefs, but it, basically it's a Christian thrust. And so, uh, you know, when I was a kid, and here's something that maybe will resonate with you. When I was a kid, we had circuses and we had zoos. And the zoos, the first time I ever saw one, I believe it was in Fresno, I was very young. And all I remember is going into a big dark building and seeing lots of cages. Mm. I don't remember what was in them and I don't remember much else going on. You can't do that anymore today. No. And it's good you can't. That's not how animals should be treated. They shouldn't mm -hmm. be boxed up and made to be things that you poke at and, and spit at and ooh and ah over. Awe, maybe in the proper sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed uh, my wife and I, for that matter, both like um, circus animals, you know, little crackers. <laughs> and then the, 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 the iced, iced ones, too. Mm -hmm. But um, the, originally they were Barnum circus animals. Yeah. They're not they anymore. They came in they, a little box. Yeah. And the, that little box was supposed to represent a train car, a box car. Mm hmm with and it had bars on it and the animals were behind the bars. You go look now, you won't find that. It just calls them animals, Barnum's animals, I think. <laughs> and what you see behind them is um oh what's what's the, the savannah. Hmm. You just they're free. They're not we don't we don't even want to teach our children anymore that you cage animals. You can eat them apparently, but you can't cage them. You know? <laughs> Uh, which, you know, it's, there's there's some biblical truth going on there. Mm -hmm. A couple things about this, you know, uh, uh, spiritually, yes, they are symbols of human beings where someone like the, a ravening wolf like uh, Saul of Tars Tarsus lies down with a sheep like Barnum. That's true. But is that all that's there? Do we, we, we know the creation fell with us, fell under our curse. Do we think that God will redeem us, use them as a parable for our redemption and leave them behind? Wait a second. I just just caught what you said. A a lion like Paul, Saul wolf. of Tarsus, wolf like Saul of Tarsus, yeah. and the lamb like Barnabas. Yeah, is that have something I, you've is heard? Is that in the Bible? Have I missed that all these years? <laughs> well, Benjamin shall raven like a wolf. Jacob uh, said in his prophecy. Yes. Okay. I wondered where that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and how many times are Christian called a flock? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm still waiting for a biblical theology lecture on why there are two Benjamites named Saul in the Bible. Well, because one's the image of the other. Yes. The whole lecture. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want, you want precise want parallels more. all the way around. More. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I've never done that one, but it shouldn't be that hard. 
Um, you should never say that to God. <laughs> um, it's like, oh, you so, think it's that easy? <laughs> you think it's that easy? I try this one. Uh, I would note a couple other things. So that the, and that's the presence of little children here. Mm-hmm. The little child shall lead the animals. And the little child, the sucking child, shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his hand on the cock and price his den. They're playing with the animals. These are little children playing with the animals that once upon a time were vicious. Mm-hmm. But now it's safe, and we don't distance ourselves. We don't say, well, those are those were wild animals, but they're safe now, so we'll let them run away, and we'll leave them behind, and we'll go do important human things. We, we still put our children out there to play with them, even to play mm. with snakes. So that's also something that's going on here. And there was something else that I have forgotten. There was something else I was going to say, but I lost it. There's a similar passage in Isaiah 65 where, well, let's, let me go ahead and turn there. It's The wording is very similar, but it does include the context of a new heaven and a new earth, which in itself is worthy of a lot of discussion. Chapter 65, verse 17, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered nor come into mind, but be ye glad and rejoice forever and that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing in her people, a joy, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed, and they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall... Plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Oh, I know what it was now. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they're yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. The thing I suddenly remembered is, not only is this pointing forward, but this is pointing backward. It's pointing backward to Eden. Mm -hmm. It's also pointing back to the ark, Mm -hmm. where the animals lay down together safely in peace. And I think we've talked about that, this whole idea of taking the day when a whole planet died and reducing it to nursery status and putting uh, (laughs) pictures of little animals sticking their heads out of a boat to adorn infant nurseries. How barbaric and sick are we? Yes, the giraffes are here to see the tapestries, I know. Um, We are a castle and we have many tapestries. (laughs) (laughs) But here in, in, in... New heaven and new earth. Well, what does that mean? And that, again, is, is a question of, of biblical and theological, biblical theology and systematic theology that needs to be studied out. It's, it's easy to take a swipe and say, well, all that means is, well, no, it's, it, there's no, that's all that means. <laughs> We're new creatures in Christ, and we already by faith have come to the new Jerusalem. And these promises here that he continues to be a God to us and our children, and he hears us while we're still speaking or before we speak. These are current realities for us. Um, and so, again, we can say, well, there's a spiritual dimension that within the church, the those who were vicious and those who were not so are, are lying down together. But it is, but the new heavens and the new earth also have a future fulfillment. And here mm-hmm. we will go to Romans 8. Where again, we, we we could wish that Paul said a whole lot more. It's what he's saying is important. It's just not maybe the most important thing we say, but we we, but we want to know more, Paul. <laughs> he says this, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creation, creature, itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So he ties the resurrection of the righteous of God's covenant people into the redemption of the planet and its animals. Somehow they are waiting as a woman in travail, waiting for something better. It hurts, but there is an expectation and hope somehow. And it it comes together in the resurrection. So apparently those 
those passages in Isaiah are not simply metaphor. There is something more going on here. And it's at this point, you know, when, anytime I teach this in school, this is the lecture. There's, there's two lectures that, that my students will never stop asking questions about. <laughs> One is the resurrection, the other sex and marriage. You know, they just they keep going, they keep going. They, I think because no one ever talks to them about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, well, does that mean that they are, there will be animals in the new creation? That, well, how about my puppy? Is he going to come back? To, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate Lewis's line. God never takes away something without giving us something better in its place. But I don't know how that applies or what that means. Mm -hmm. But obviously, um, what we lost, we get back and more besides which is also the theme of Romans 5, uh, comparing and contrasting Christ and Adam. Mm -hmm. So the animal creation and thus pets are something that God's going to redeem, uh, the animals and that, our relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And so if understanding that, I think, begins to balance some of your concerns. Uh, understanding that children are not animals probably should be in there someplace, too, <laughs> although it's kind of a different story, which is kind of the point. Uh, fur babies, no, they're not. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. They, they, they're they a good what, what is the word you use for something that temporarily takes the place of something else while you're getting over it there's a word for that I don't know what substitute not a substitution that's more <laughs> permanent yeah uh, <laughs> uh, can't. interim placeholder <laughs> yeah placeholder. <laughs> placeholder there you go <laughs> um, whatever whatever it should be you know we, we, we hug the cat because we've lost someone and I understand that, but but sane people don't go on holding cats and giving up children mm -hmm. uh, as long as children are a possibility because they're not the same. But There's, that doesn't mean the cat or cats or dogs are trash either. Right. There's actually a really great comedic routine that that kind of covers the issue with uh, replacing children with animals, and mm -hmm. it's basically um, first of all the comedi the comedian's name is Eliza Schlesinger. And she's hilarious. A little bit crass, but it's hard to escape these days. And um, she's talking about, like, let's say that you go on a date with a guy. And when you get back to your house, like, the next morning, you, you know, maybe you don't know what's happening with this guy, but you realize, like, oh, I need to nurture something. And your eyes turn like Terminator vision locked <laughs> on the dog. <laughs> and the dog is confused because it knows something bad is about to happen. <laughs> and you go, who's the baby? <laughs> and grab the dog. And like you've get, gotten your serotonin fix and mm -hmm. the dog is like traumatized, but it has a short term memory. So it like doesn't remember it <laughs> 10 seconds later. And then yeah. 15 minutes pass and you need the serotonin hit again. Yeah. And so you turn back to the dog and the dog's like, what, what's going on? And you go, who's the baby? And it goes, oh, no, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> but she makes a really good point that like there's that nurturing impulse yeah. that mm – -hmm we really just kind of flip the bird at we we don't <laughs> care about it and we're like ah oh, but there's still that impulse underneath everything that we're doing and then we just kind of turn it towards what we do have and it's a dog mm -hmm. and you frighten the dog <laughs> <laughs> and it's not necessarily a very healthy thing to do <laughs> the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel oh mm -hmm. nice that goes with the righteous man regards the life of his beast. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Emily, I think that's a good place to stop. Yeah, that's good because we're out of time. <laughs> I, 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 I did, convenient. So. Yeah. Uh, do we have any recommendations to close no. out? Yes. <laughs> no. We're at, oh, well, Brian, I have Brian a has one. All right. Well, you two have recommendations. Right. Go okay. first, Emily. I, I've always gone first. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my recommendation is a book called Lessons from a Sheepdog. This is by Philip Keller who mm. is the shepherd who looked at Psalm 23, that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And he just tells the story of a border collie that helped him out on his sheep ranch and getting to know this dog who'd come from not so good a place, so he had to really win her trust and mm. set her free in order to do that. And just it's it's a little nostalgic for me because I grew up with a border collie, but also just really, really nice and relevant to our discussion here. Nice. So, lessons from a sheepdog, Philip Keller. 
Mine is less relevant to what we were talking about, <laughs> uh, except in the title. Um, I finished this book last week. It is called Dominion by Tom Holland. Mm. And uh, Tom Holland is a, his- a British historian who has written quite extensively on uh, the ancient world. His first book I read was about the fall of the Roman Republic into a dictatorship. It's phenomenal. That one is called Rubicon. I've recommended it before, as a matter of fact. <laughs> this book is a overview survey of Western culture as a whole and the influence that Christianity has had upon it in the past 2,000 years. And it is simply incredible. As an idea, he gave an interview about this book once where he basically said, um, you know, I'm an agnostic, but I loved looking at ancient cultures and civilizations and I just I threw myself into studying them. I wrote several books about them. I just loved them so much, but I never saw in Rome or Greece or Babylon or Persia anything that western culture values. The individuality of the human being, mm-hmm. the importance of life, the duties of of public charity. These are all things that Christianity gave to the mm-hmm. west and it's yes. not present in, in the pagan world. And so he just he kind of runs with that theme uh, in a general broad sense, even even pointing to things like the modern. He has a whole. I think the last chapter is called "Woke," um, hmm. where he talks about <laughs> how this drive towards social improvement is something that the pagans never had. No, it's no. something that is is very Christian, even if they reject the very underpinning belief system of it. it it's something that they've inherited from that worldview. And it's so good, you guys. I recommend <laughs> well, it 100%. What, what's the title again? Uh, Dominion, Dominion by Tom Holland. Okay. I, I, I think I will secure that. Actually, I did come up with a recommendation. Oh, good. Awesome. This is, do you remember Little Golden Books? Yeah. No. The little – they're bored on the books. front. Yeah. They're the little you know, what on the cardboard front? front? Cardboard, but, like a board book, but they have real pages. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the little gold um, spine, and you can pick them up at used bookstores, so and most of them are trash. But once upon <laughs> a time, some of them were actually pretty good. Uh, Heidi is pretty good. Mm-hmm. and um, Oh, okay, yes. Uh, the Nutcracker, a couple others. But this one is called The New Pony. Oh. And it's about uh, a little boy who, for his birthday is almost given a pony, almost in the sense that his father says, well, he's not yours yet. You have to prove that you that you own him by taking care of him. Hmm. And little boy, it's, it's, you know, it's not a deep story, but little boy goes through things little boys are want to do. Like, I got in late. I'm tired. My pony can wait till tomorrow for food. No, he can't. Hmm. You know, things like that. And it, it's a really cute little sweet story, but I think it might be a good thing to get children just before they get their first pet. Um, so... The New Pony and the illustrator apparently is Dagmar Perrin and Vlad Shinnery, and the author is listed as Wilson. That's a little weird. I don't know how that works. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, that concludes this discussion of the theology of pet ownership. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, One thing I haven't said lately is thank you to Maggie Smith, the artist who came up with our cover art. Uh, Check her stuff out if you're looking for art of any kind, graphic design, any kind of good stuff. We'll put a link to her and to everything we've mentioned in the show notes. So visit our website to find those that's anchor.fm slash halting towards zion like us on facebook follow us on not twitter what's the other thing youtube subscribe to our channel that's what i was looking for and we'll see you next week